This is WBAA, I'm Mike Lowitzo. Alan Beck is one of the authors of Between Pets and People, The Importance of Animal Companionship. Thanks so much for coming in today, Alan. It's my pleasure. Now, this is a very interesting book, and at some times I thought it was almost over information overload, because there's so many interesting facts and studies and stories about people and their pets. How did this come about? And this was originally printed back in 1983. Right. Uh, I really, in, in the late 70s and 80s, there was... I mean, there's always been an interest in animals. There's always the assumption that animals were, were good for people. I mean, ever since we've been domesticated ourselves, we've uh, living in villages, we, we had animals. Uh, but And then in, in 1980, the first study done at the University of Pennsylvania showed that, uh, with Aaron Katcher and, and Erica Friedman, that showed people with who owned animals actually had a better one-year survival after a heart attack than people who've had heart attacks who were non-owners and so on. Uh, we, we organized a, a group called the Delta Society that was beginning to look at this. I was actually sort of the odd person in that up until that point, I was looking at the problems animals caused. I was with the New York Health Department. I was studying animal bites, diseases from animals. But then uh, uh, the University of Pennsylvania got funding from the, to open the first, what is now, was the first center at any veterinary school to really look at both people and animals together as opposed to just human health and animal health, which is more typical of a veterinary school. And that's when I moved to Pennsylvania. I met Aaron Katcher, who was just very much interested in the social support systems and very much interested in uh, animals. And we started looking at what people were doing uh, with animals. Uh, and the idea is that I think one of the reasons people didn't really take the fact that there was a relationship seriously is that no one saw the obvious connection, how it would work. And I think it's appropriate to be a little concerned if you don't understand why something should work. And of course, Aaron being a great psychiatrist, uh, and I'm just a, sort of a, 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 an observer, I was actually studying stray dogs, uh, observer, uh, we looked at how people talk to, uh, to animals, to, to their animals you know, in a veterinary school. And as soon as they started talking to their animals, they looked more relaxed. Uh, they would talk more slowly, sometimes with a higher pitch, sounds somewhat reminiscent of how we talk to children. Uh, and they just looked more comfortable. So Aaron says, are they really more comfortable? I mean, they self-reported to be more comfortable. So we put blood pressure uh, equipment on them. And sure enough, there's a true relaxation response. And then it sort of occurred that one of the, probably several mechanisms in which animals are important to people, but one is what's, what you might call social support. Uh, we social animals, we people, find great comfort in each other. I mean, that is the most important part of our life, is usually the other people in it. Uh, we seek out behaviors, uh, we, we talk to each other, we all cultures touch and hug to show uh, bonding so they won't kill each other. Uh, we try to seek out to do things together. Um, and this is, so we, all, we really started the book looking at what are those behaviors that we know people do with each other that, that are also done consciously or unconsciously with, uh, with animals. And sure enough, uh, people talk to each other. That's very important. Well, it turns out that about 97% of people talk to their dogs. 3% lied. We, we do that. <laughs> uh, not only do they talk to their dogs, but about oh, almost half of all adults and better than three quarters of all children confide in their animals and talk to their animals as if there really is a reason. It's not like talking to a plant. They honestly think the animal at least understands the mood, if not the words. So we know that we talk. We know people seek, to, for at least many kinds of animals, such as dogs, cats, horses, uh, a touch. And sure enough, the touch gives you the same comfort as touching people in terms of a relaxation response. Uh, and then other kinds of animals play different kinds of roles. One way that we deal with uh, the world is to have a, a positive distraction hold our, something that holds our attention without being too stimulating, which sort of keeps us in the, in the present, because you only worry about the, it's only thinking about the past and the future that really causes grief. Uh, and sure enough, a lot of our animals are a wonderful distraction, uh, a focus of attention, fish, birds. People would just sit and watch, you know, bird feeding or even watch their dog and cat play. And it's something that even children, infants orient towards animals. It's a wonderful way of focusing your attention. So there's, then there's exercise. People do more things with their, with their animals. So that's what uh, 
we were sort of writing up all these little little articles, and then uh, you know, Putnam, a major uh, book publisher, came and says, you know, everybody's realizing there's something going on here. Uh, why don't you guys, since they're always quoting you, write the book? Because if you don't, I'm going to give it to someone else to write. So <laughs> with an author like that, <laughs> how could you refuse? We couldn't refuse. So that's how the book uh, came about. So what was, what's this relationship with you and Aaron Catcher? I mean, it's something where you were just both working sort we, of we, in the same well, Once I moved to Paris, we became collaborators. Yeah. So we wrote a lot of our initial papers together. We wrote three books together. One of the first things uh, we did it at, at, now that we had a new center was to have a, a conference of, of people because it was just an area that was really catching on. This is in 81. That was actually our first book was a, a, a conference book. Um, and it was probably the first at least U.S. conference in this area. There actually was one in England earlier. Um, because they're around really the world. Uh, there were people looking at various aspects, whether it be you know, the use of animals in therapy or in child development. That was a major area of focus. Uh, in fact, it was a major area of focus at Purdue. Um, so uh, we had this this sort of conference, and it really became more and more of an area. I mean, to, I said there was one center in, in 1980. Uh, now about half of all the veterinary schools in, in the country, 12 of the 29, have uh, various kinds of, of formulations to look at our relationship with animals, centers and study groups and, and so on. So it's an area. By 1987, the National Institutes of Health held a conference uh, on the uh, on the really on the health benefits of pets. It was finally recognized that our relationship with animals is worthy of study. Remember, none of the long-term health studies, the very famous Framingham study, where a population uh, was studied for 50 years. That's how we know so much about health and and heart disease and and other things. They never included animals as a variable. Uh, so only now we realize that no health, legitimate health, long-term health study is complete without also looking at uh, animal contact. Remember, pet ownership is common in at least 61% of all U.S. households. It's a major event. It's not a rare event. And it's a billion dollar a year oh, industry oh, yeah. sure. for the food right. companies, the people who make the jackets for dogs. Dogs, <laughs> right. It's a wonderful uh, hobby. Um, I, I can very often it's someone criticized because of the money aspect, but no other hobby is ever criticized. For some reason, it's okay to spend millions on golf and waste lots of space, but you know, having animals that really even help your health is always questioned. I always thought that was interesting. Uh, so yes, it, it's a major activity, uh, um, and it, it's not cultural. It's biological. Every culture has some pattern of pet ownership. The book covers, you know, almost everything about pet ownership. You know, pets as a member of the family when they die, mourning pets, you know, sure. bestiality, the be the downside of pets, service dogs, children and autism. What's maybe one or two of the most favorite things you've looked into? Well, you know, there's one, one of the areas that we looked at, and, and in fact there's even a, a whole separate book from Purdue Press, on the hoarding issue, because that's one of the things that... Uh, and it by no means represents a major component to animal ownership. Um, but there are some people who are so focused with animals that it becomes really is their whole uh, focus of life, and they accumulate you know, animals to a point where it's unhealthy for, to the animals, to themselves, and to the community. So we, we've looked at, at that a little bit. I'm actually sort of interested, and the book sort of flirts at this, some of the less studied f interactions, like like... Uh, after studying so much of the blood pressure effects of, of dogs, I once was kidding Aaron. I said, everybody's going to stop buying dogs. We better get some. You know, that's going to be a problem. What, what's something else? As a joke, he said, well, the most opposite would be fish. So we started looking at fish tanks and, and fish. And one of Aaron's jobs at, at Penn was the, uh, the psychiatrist in the dental school because there they had a major uh, uh, program for people who are dental phobic, people who Believe it or not, there are some people who don't like to go to dentists. I, oh. I can't believe it, but it's true. <laughs> and uh, so much so that they really endanger their own health. And so he actually worked with, with uh, one of our collaborators, who was actually a dental uh, hypnotist. And we introduced the idea of just having fish tanks, exposing people to fish tanks, not in the actual operatory, because it's just not enough space and all that. Besides, the dentist wants to control your head. They don't want you to control your head. Uh, 
So we had them either looking at fish, and then different people would either looking at uh, uh, you know, a nice poster, and then they would go to the, uh, to the dental operatory, and, and the student dentist, no less, uh, and the dentist and the student dentist did not know what the pretreatment was for these people. And sure enough, the people who saw fish for 20 minutes before going to the dental, uh, this is molar extraction, uh, were actually more relaxed, used less Novocaine, stopped the, the procedures less, had lower blood pressures, more controlled blood pressures. So our relationship with, with, with even just looking at fish was a very real phenomenon. Uh, since then, by the way, I mean, uh, post this, bu this book, we are working with uh, Nancy Edwards here at Purdue, uh, we used fish to get Alzheimer's patients to actually be more calm and therefore eat more because they lose a lot of weight because they're either too too lethargic or too agitated. But fish holds even the Alzheimer's patient attention, which is interesting because I mean one of the theories of why animals are important besides social support is what's generally called the biophilia hypothesis. That is, there's an inborn attraction that we humans have towards nature. We're fascinated by living things. Um, that's why you know we're fascinated with green. We we when people want to take a, a, a break, they don't they don't walk a parking lot. They walk <laughs> in the park. Right. Uh, and we were interested, and uh, so there's no not surprising that most people find fish that holds their uh, watching a fish tank relaxing and holds, something that holds your attention. But the very fact that people with even advanced Alzheimer's will stop and look at fish, unlike any other thing you can use to hold their attention probably supports the idea that this attraction towards nature is, is inborn, so deeply inborn, it even survives dementia. So uh, this is part of just the, you know, the many relationships we're interested in, 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 in birds, because again, there was less studied. And it turns out that people talk to their birds even more than they talk to their dogs, because much of our relationship with birds is, is, is verbal, you know, whistling and singing and so on. Is it the, because you mentioned, you know, talking to plants and, you know, kids talk to dolls all the time. Is it the human or the, the living aspect of it that they can sort of react to you? I mean, birds fly around, dogs can sort of give you a facial expression when you're talking to them, whether it's, you know, meaningful or not. <laughs> is that the, the key that brings down, you it's know, the blood pressure? That, people? Yes, I think that's part of it. It's an excellent question. The blood pressure effect is in part holding your attention. If you're more relaxed into something else holding your attention that's not causing grief, you get a blood pressure response. Uh, you tend to intuitively talk more quietly to animals, and that too will drop your blood pressure. Uh, as Aaron used to say, if you just talk with commas, you'd be much better off. <laughs> uh, but it's interesting you say that because as we get older, I think we need that kind of feedback from the mammals and birds. Uh, our ability for a sort of a suspension of disbelief is, is harder. The younger you are, and, and uh, Gail Melson, who was just retired from Purdue University in Child Development, we worked together, um, and was also part of the, the both uh, our conferences, pointed out that the, you know, the younger people um, are much more free and have better imaginations. So you can see a young person talking to their hamster or gerbil with the same dedication that you might with your just golden retriever. Um, I, once, was once, I once came across a child who was talking to his hermit crab. Uh, I was at a bed and breakfast, and when I went over, and I thought it was going to be a gerbil or, uh -huh. or a mouse, it was a hermit crab. But he was talking with the same higher pitch, lower volume, trying to encourage food feeding. Um, so I think we lose that wonderful ability, that imagination. So a stuffed animal or a, 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 a pocket pet doesn't quite stimulate the nurturing behaviors that we get with, with a large bird or a cat or a, a dog. Uh, so yes, the feedback is probably important. How, are, how is this relationship between humans and animals um, or pets changing the pets? I mean, obviously they're domesticated, they depend on us anyway, but in, in long term, I mean, is there gonna be some sort of evolutionary change in these animals? Both good and bad, actually, yes. There are now more, not unquestionably, there are probably a thousand times more dogs than there are wolves in, in the world. Sure. Uh, so we've, we've this new niche for the, for the wolf, the pot. <laughs> Uh, is, is obviously, for the most part, doing very well. Um, my, one of my personal concerns, and it's, it's by no means personal, uh, I'm not alone in this, is that our fascination with morphology of dogs, the, the, the fancy breeds, 
rather than what dogs were supposed to do and so on. And then breeding for things that are not necessarily in the dog's best interest, I think is a real problem. Uh, so we have health problems that really were, were, are being co were caused by our genetic selection, not because of, of the dog or, or disease. So we have, you know, that I think is something that we, I think we're beginning to start questioning it and, and getting a little smarter about it. Um, and I think we're beginning to get more comfortable with the idea that our contact with nature is important. And so if dogs or cats are not exactly right for you at this time, um, encouraging people to bird watch, to go hiking, walking down the Grand Canyon, to appreciate uh, wildlife. Uh, or some of the other varieties of pets that are perhaps lower maintenance. One of the theories of why we're seeing so many cats is that uh, cats seem to do just fine with owners that have a little less time than, say, dogs do. Uh, and we're beginning to, you know, to see that. So just a sort of appreciation of the variety of animals. What's been the reaction to this book? Uh, obviously, everybody is now knowing the the positive effect of having pets. But I mean, do you have any naysayers, or, or what's the good and the bad? No, what I was I, I, <laughs> the only negative reaction is not it's not an incredibly bestseller. It <laughs> uh, that's the only, the only problem. It's amazing the the, the the letters we do get, and it, it's are uh, a very positive. That they they love that kind of information. They they enjoy it. Remember. People sort of knew that animals were important and they loved their animals. So to find out that they even have therapy value or they're good for you just validates something that they really were hoping was true anyway. <laughs> they're not the crazy cat lady or the, the person with <laughs> right. the six dogs at home. Uh, now, also, you are the editor of the New Directions in Human Animal Bond series for Purdue Press. Talk about some of the other titles. I mean, there's about two dozen or oh, more at than least, two dozen, yes. right? Uh, and again, these are, are, are books that are very, very uh, important to you know, subpopulations. Some are actually you know, quite important. There are several from Frank Fran uh, Asioni on the studies of our relationship between abuse, child abuse, and animal abuse, which is an area that's we're getting more and more study because it's a, it's a very real relationship. Uh, so we have several books on that. Uh, we have a, a book on the use of animals with autistic uh, children. Uh, it's funny, we had a, I was approached the last two years ago, three years ago, by a, a person from New York City, uh, uh, Mike Brando, who was uh, writing a book on the history of the New York scoop law. Now he called me at, to interview me because I worked for the New York Health Department and I was at that time Mayor Koch's sort of spokesperson to introduce the scoop law, to make the scoop Lucky law <laughs> more, more palatable uh, to uh, the community. So after interviewing me, and, and, and I, I told him I would send him lots of pictures and all the crazy scoops that were sent to me when I worked for the health department, uh, I suggested that if he doesn't have a publisher, <laughs> I have one for you. And it's actually been a great, it got re reviewed in The New Yorker and all in, in The New York Times, all over the place. And it's a wonderful, serious book on the history of the scoop law. Uh, we'll be having a, a, a book on, on leash law soon. So that's, that's the kind of... of uh, new kinds of contributions that you don't uh, often do. We have, uh, uh, you know, earlier books on, on the life of, of an animal shelter uh, person. Who, again, these are interesting, uh, may not have huge audiences, but they're in the true spirit of the academic book in that it's really addressing some interesting social issues. And this is a real uh, niche, if you say, for Purdue University Press. I mean, do you know yeah. any others that have this? No, sort it's of very, no, it, it's really wonderful. I mean, obviously, we're one of the land-grant veterinary schools, so it's nice, there's interest. In fact, even the, the admissions book for veterinary, uh, to get into veterinary school came out of Purdue Press, so it's unrelated to the, to the series. So it was really nice. It's a, one, I think, one of the, the, the new changes for Purdue Press in the last you know, 10, 20, uh, since I've been here, uh, was to start addressing and publishing in the areas that, that are the strength of Purdue, which is in you know, agriculture, in, in uh, various kinds of animal sciences and animal medicine, and it's, it's kind of a, 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 a logical thing to do. Um, so it's kind of nice. This, is, this series is probably the first real venture into looking at some of the uh, small animal and social issues as opposed to just agricultural issues. Um, I, we did republish my original book on stray dogs. Uh, I'm uh, 
<laughs> uh, my book and Stray Dogs always can, can considered a, a classic in the field, and I have to keep reminding people it's because it's the only book <laughs> in the field. So if you want a classic, <laughs> that's the way to do it. <laughs> Alan Beck is a co-author of Between Pets and People: The Importance of Animal Companionship, published by Purdue University P Press. Thanks so much, Alan. My pleasure. You're listening to WBAA. I'm Mike Lewitzo.